Hi, Rosamond, how are you? I'm doing well, how are you? I'm well, just a little rushed. Had to rush home. <laughs> Well, that's what happens. See, I'm retired, so I don't have to rush. Let me admit all these people. <laughs> if you want to retire early. <laughs> yeah, I want to retire early. Okay, let me. Um, oh, I have two Ilkas. No, yeah, two. Hi, Sarah. Two. All right. Now you just have one. Hi. Well, now we just have one. Okay, I will be with everybody in just a moment. Um, Rosamond, I made you and Sarah um, co-host, and I'll be right back. I just need to go over everything. Okay. Oh, and I don't know if you guys saw it, but um, Malia Cohen has come to our meeting tonight. Pardon me, I didn't hear that. I'm sorry. Malia Cohen is going to speak at our meeting this evening. Okay. Um, she's only going to be with us briefly, um, but I was I saw her in another meeting. And yeah, you right there. Sorry, my hair is a mess. Hi, Rosamond. How are you? I keep seeing you in well. circles. I don't know why. <laughs> I mean, maybe it's because we care. <laughs> Maybe it's because we're active and we're going to get this on. Now, you're, you're not a member, are you? No, you're not. But you're a guest. Well, I'm a, I am a guest. I do want to be a member right now, but I, I'm just financially looking for a job. So I, I can't uh, financially join, but I want to. I want to give you money as soon as I have it. Well, you, you know, you can join with the hardship and, and the, the membership isn't that expensive. So think about it. We'd love to have you. How, what is the hardship one? Oh, it's if you can't pay. I think it's like, I, I think the regular membership is 20, and I think the hardship is five, something like that. But, right you know, now, because yeah. I, I'm moving, and those three Shih Tzus I have, they're expensive. <laughs> I thought a son was expensive. No, dogs. Dogs are much more expensive. <laughs> oh, I'm not, yeah, they are, mm -hmm. especially when you have Shih Tzus. They have to go in every week because their hair... Here, I'll show you one. Like, this is my oldest girl. She's cute. And she's, a girl and she's a sweetheart. And then I rescued two from Kentucky. So, they needed a home and they were being really ill treated. Like this little girl. Oh, they're cute. But you know what? Dogs never borrow your car. They never break curfew. Uh, <laughs> they never talk back to you. <laughs> oh, yes, they do. <laughs> and they love you no matter if your hair is standing up on top. Whatever happens to you, they love you no matter what. The dogs never tell you they're embarrassed by your outfit. Oh, oh they have embarrassed. never. I agree. They like you no matter what. And sometimes it's kind of like, well, I wish they could like bark at me. Like, do you really want to go out in that? Like give that bark, like, ruff, 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 you know, my son would mom. I, I don't know. Try something a little different. <laughs> yeah. And they never ask for money or allowance. <laughs> they cost you just, you just shell it out. You know what I love to see in the background, Rosamond, is the books, because people don't realize books are so vital. I, I would never give up my books. They're not, they're an investment to me. That looks like something fun to go through. Hi, Marvin. Hi, Rosamond. How are you doing? I'm doing good. Thanks for having me. Just listening in today.
I don't know why, but I was like, I to push my teeth. <laughs> All right. Ah, Love your oh, hair. Sorry. I, I, un, I unmuted the wrong one. I meant to unmute the sound. Listening to a kid presentation, and I will be back in a few minutes. All right. Kid presentations are very, very important. Ooh. Okay. Now. Let's see here. Oh, what happened? Boop. Oh, that's what happened. Okay. Let me do this. Boop. Trying to find some like mellow um, music to listen to. Marvin Gaye? You know, that's not a bad idea. Let's see here. How about... Oh, I know the song I want to hear. I felt like listening something to something by a local artist. So, uh, this would be probably not mellow, but Candy Kane was an amazing local artist uh, who uh, fought cancer for many, many years. Uh, broken uh, down away in in living life on a merry go round. You can't find a fight. But I see it in you, so we can walk it out. Ooh, mountain. We gon' walk it out and move on days and The silence is in and it feels like it's getting hard to breathe. And I know you feel like dying, but I promise we would take the world to its feet. Ooh, I won't take, bring it to its feet. Ooh, I won't take.
How you find? Hello. <laughs> Sorry, I was muted. That's all good. Did we get our guest speaker? Yes. She's Excellent. coming on at nine at wait nine, six forty-five. Okay, cool. <laughs> I felt like I was in a San Diego kind of mood. <laughs> um, agenda coming right up. <laughs> I had to leave the house to work today, so it threw me off my um, everything. I don't know how comfortable I got being able to commute from my bed to my um, desk <laughs> without leaving the house. <laughs> I'm sure you're not the only person who got that. <laughs> Oh, and I got new technology on my door today, which is great timing. They installed um, keyless um, locks, keyless entry on our on our doors. And of course, this is the day that my daughter left her phone at home. <laughs> Something she hasn't done in three years that I know of. How old is your daughter, Moana? My daughter is 37. That must, well, you don't look like you have a 37 year old. Look what you have to look forward to, Sarah. <laughs> Yours is little. She probably won't let go of her phone now. <laughs> your phone, anyway. Oh, gosh. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, no. Um, mine would have a phone, a phone in her hands at all times if if she were allowed to, for sure. She'll find a way one day. Well, she absolutely that, will. I think that that's... Um, I don't necessarily think it's a bad thing. It just comes along with a whole bunch of skills that we all need to learn about having these little devices all the time. So we can learn it together. Oh, man. All right, we're at 616. Tonight's gonna go by really fast because um, apparently we have many, many time certains. <laughs> Sarah, I don't know where, but I found a study where there were some schools that would do reward time, but specifically for Minecraft, because it's a building app, so they have to put their mind and their thinking pads, you know, together. Of course, they still say, I think it's after 30 minutes, you need a 15 minute break. Now, if only we followed that, right? If only we did, <laughs> yeah. All day. Yeah, my kids play Minecraft, they love it. Um, they're generally not they're usually only doing 30 minute segments, so they get the built in break. Oh. All right, this song should be a, I don't most of you probably haven't heard this next song. <laughs> The 
Luana, how long is our speaker? Are we expecting to have her? I think I'm going to put our meeting on the TV for the kids while she's on. Um, so Malia Cohen's going to give us 10 minutes. Okay. And then um, Secretary um, Rodriguez is going to have 30 minutes. Cool. And is, is that at 6.45? Or, or when so Leah Cohen's going to go on at 6.45, and then we're going to follow the agenda um, beyond that. But usually, our, I mean, depending on how many candidate announcements and all that other stuff we have. Let me see here. And I'm updating the agenda because... Um, but this is um, what we currently have, and I haven't slotted in um, Malia Cohen. Um, it depends on how quickly we can get through the, um, you know. Does anyone know the, the, the title for for our Board of Equalization? Do we say honorable? Is she the honorable Malia Cohen, or how do we? How is that? That's what I was. That's what they I, they used in another meeting. So I was just going to roll with that. It sounds it sounds because, right because I don't I think, think it's like member. So because she's the chair, she's the chair of the Board of Equalization, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so yesterday when we were at another meeting, she they called her the honorable. So if anybody has other San Diego female artists that they'd like me to pull up, we've got like two more minutes where I can go back to what we have and just play more music by now. Luana, can you let me chat with um, anybody? For there's a couple of questions there that I need to direct to one person and can only let me chat with you. <laughs> oh, well, um, let me see. You're a co-host, so you should be able to chat with everybody. No, it's, it won't let me, but that's okay if you can. Let me. Did you did you do the drop the drop down menu lesson? Yeah, uh -huh. it says host only. Oh. Well, you're listed as a co-host. Sarah, what are your options? Everybody. Okay. So I'm not sure, Rosamond, what's going on because you're a co-host as well. Okay, I'll, I'll try it again okay. as soon as I get it. As soon as I get everybody in. So, yeah. so did we turn? So the the chat is not available for anybody else. Um, if the chat is set up the way you guys have me set it up during endorsements, I haven't reconfigured it. Oh, okay. Um. I mean, I could end the meeting, reconfigure it, and then restart the meeting. No, I, I think I think we'll we'll live through this meeting. Okay. <laughs> um, cool. Put it on our to do list to open up chatting again. Yeah. Because now we'll have to, if, if we have candidates, we're going to have to try to copy have sure. them like. So in, mo in many meetings, it's standard that the candidates just put whatever they want to put in the chat for um, one of the co-hosts or, or okay. in, in the right. panelists right. Panelist to copy yeah, and well, paste to everyone. Um, right. That's what I. That's what I was going to say. Okay. You'll just thing. have to then copy and um, paste it back out. Okay. Honey, I think it's a honey colored maple, maybe golden oak or mm -hmm. honey pine or something like that. See that thing one. This is Ruth, and I just wanted to say, Susan, I love your view.
Tired of being the bigger person, but I know God is a bigger Thank you for, person. For, um, oh, it looks like my uh, my view disappeared. But anyway, let's put it back up. Reacted to shit they say. All these petty subliminals don't have you grow. Hi, Lori. Hey, good evening. How's everybody doing? Hi, Lori. Hi, Rosamond. Good to see you all. Yeah. Nice for spring to finally be arriving. <laughs> oh, yes. That and allergies. <laughs> That's true. My desert tortoises are finally waking up. So I. I can always Hello, Lori. you have Lori. I have two desert tortoises that have been in the family for over 50 years. Wow. So we had a tortoise. We went to Death Valley when I was very young, like 20 years ago. No, I'm kidding. But I was very young and there was a tortoise in the middle of the street. Um, so we did bring it home and we called it Sam, you know, 52. I must have been four at the time. And uh I went to the zoo with my class and they explained how uh, the tortoise's body is, if it's a male or a female, how they mate. So I came home very proud to announce to my mom that Sam was a Samantha. <laughs> I was so proud, I was so proud, like mom, mom. And now we know what the, the eggs were that she would lay even though they were on fertilized. Uh, well, I have two boys and they fight, so I have to keep them apart. How do they fight? How do they? Yeah, As, what is their battle method? <laughs> they ram each other. And the males have this hook under the front nice. that they use to try to get underneath another one and tip it over on its back. And the lungs, I've, I have learned about tortoise anatomy. The lungs of a tortoise are on the top of their shell. So if they get tipped over, they suffocate. Wow. So I, if I fail to close a gate or they manage to get through and they fight, I just, I'm horrified. It's so stressful <laughs> because they really will try to kill each other. And wow. they're very territorial. So that's the downside of having two boys. Um, and, but the nice thing is they're seasonal pets. So they are only really active about half the year. <laughs> So I tell people, if you want to travel in, this, in the winter and fall, then get tortoises. You don't have to worry about pet sitters. So, so as they say, boys will be boys. In your uh, tortoise's case, it is very true. It is so stressful. I hate it. Mr. Doug Case, where are those fancy shoes? Mm. Right, on your feet. You guys should watch my Facebook page. Huh. I watch your Facebook page for fashion. All righty. Hello, folks. Let me put on my glasses so I can actually read the names. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> oh, man. If you want to know how important glasses are, today I had a tech at my house installing um, a software on my door. They put keyless um, entry on all the doors in our apartment. And each box was labeled with the apartment number. And so they installed mine and it wouldn't work. Like, you know, I couldn't figure out if I needed to update my app or if I did something wrong. And then um, the guy left and then came back about 15 minutes later with the new box that had my apartment number written on it. And the empty box for the one he had actually installed, um, he had mistaken a three for an eight, I mean, an eight for a three. And it was never going to work because, of course, I was trying to open the wrong lock with my app. Um, and he said, you know, I should have worn my glasses today. <laughs> yes. 
yeah, I was worried that um, I wasn't going to be able to get back in my house. <laughs> I was worried he had dyslexia or, or something, because that would be a very bad thing for a technician to have mm -hmm. to manage. I agree. So let's see here. Let me put this on a Google Doc. Do, do. Um, so we, we're, we're cruising into 6.30. Um, so happy to see so many faces. Looking forward to seeing more faces soon because, I mean, I don't know if, if you don't know already, I really like to see faces. It's much easier to engage with and talk to people and, you know, have a meeting flow when you can see faces because otherwise you could be talking and you think you're being fascinating and entertaining or interesting and informational and people are actually yawning and rolling their eyes and falling asleep. But if I can see your faces, then, I mean, at least I can register a pulse. Fair enough? Okay. In order to keep things as simple as they could possibly be, because I'm a big fan of simplicity, I will put the agenda on the screen um, just so that everybody has an idea of what's happening, because there was a last minute change, for those of you who don't know. Okay. Um, um, the, the last minute change was, um, Oh, I've shared my, been sharing my screen this whole time now. Okay, cool. Ooh, here we go. Bam. All right. So um, we will have welcome and credentialing, which has been happening since six o'clock. And it looks like everyone who is here is credentialed. And um, I hope everyone here feels welcome. If you don't, please let me say welcome. We're very glad to see you and glad that you made time for us this evening. Um, after that, we have the approval of the agenda, which is displayed. Um, we will have, we will hear from candidates. As a candidate, if you have never spoken to our club before and you are not on the agenda, you get three minutes. If you have spoken before, you get one minute, unless you're on the agenda. And if you're on the agenda, you get the time that was allotted to you previously. In this case, um, similar to when we had um, candidate Galperin um, visit our club, um, we will also give Malia Cohen 10 minutes to speak. And we will have a recognition of elected officials and representatives. And then we will have our speaker, um, Secretary Rodriguez, who I'm so glad is here already. So we're not like worried about whether or not she's gonna make it. I didn't have any doubt, of course. And we will have officer reports where we will talk about some business. And then we'll have time for people to make announcements. And then unless, you know, something earth shattering happens, we will adjourn. Based on that, all this information, is there a motion to approve the agenda? So moved, Sarah Davis. I'll, I'll second. All right, we got, a, we got a motion and we got a second. Who was our yeah. second? Um, that was Nadia. All right. And, um, Let's just do a verbal, all in favor of the agenda, say aye. 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 Um, aye. Any opposed, say nay. All right, we'll move on. The agenda, we, this, is, this is what we're doing tonight. This is what is on the menu. Um, you will notice that Malia Cohen has a time certain. So depending upon where we are when that time happens, we'll shift gears, okay? Um, we've approved the agenda. Now we will hear from our candidates. Um, candidates, um, please raise your hand so that I can call on you and recognize you so that you can speak to the members of our club tonight. I know we have some candidates in the room because I recognize some of you. Um, and I would love for you to just say a couple words. Even if you've already spoken before, you know, people have to hear things like six times before they actually remember. All right, so we will start with Rebecca Cantor. Oh, and before you start, <laughs> please um, put your information in the chat for um, one of the hosts or co-hosts, and we will share it with everyone. Hi. We'll thanks stop everyone. sharing my screen so that you can see the speaker. All right, here we go. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. I'm Rebecca Cantor. I am a candidate for San Diego County Superior Court Judge, seat 35. I am an assistant United States attorney, and I've been a federal prosecutor for about 15 years. 
<clears throat> and I am in our major frauds and public corruption section. So that's my main area of expertise is complex financial fraud cases. I have also served as our civil rights coordinator and I was the deputy chief in the major crime section where I supervised 10 trial attorneys. And one of my collateral duties at the US Attorney's Office is as an ethics advisor. So I have experience with government and public ethics, which I think is really important for judicial roles. I do serve as a pro tem judge in small claims court, um, and I'm also an adjunct professor of trial skills at USD School of Law. I've been endorsed by the uh, Lawyers Club of San Diego, which is an organization I was previously on the board of, as well as Run Women Run, and I've been endorsed by uh, Tony Atkins, Nathan Fletcher, Chris Ward, Mayor Gloria, Vivian Moreno, Catherine Blakespear, and a whole bunch of other folks that are on my website, and I will put that information in the chat for you. I'm really happy to be here and chat with you tonight because my, I came up through leadership and service in the community with a Women's Bar Association committed to advancing the status of women in law and society. So what you are all doing matters a lot to me, and I'm just very happy to be able to be part of this. Thanks for having me. Thank you for being here. Um, be sure to put your information in the chat. Um, next up, we have Lori Saldana. This is getting my chat information ready. Uh, thank you for rating me as an acceptable, acceptable or qualified candidate. Uh, the campaign is going well. We had a very good event over the weekend and we're raising money now to buy yard signs. So I wanted to invite people to make a contribution. I'll post the link in the chat. Um, I've been endorsed by Run Women Run, uh, San Diego Democrats for Environmental Action. And we're already making progress, uh, getting things done uh, uh, to protect the environment here in San Diego. So um, for those who don't know me, I was a state assembly woman for six years, chair of the Legislative Women's Caucus, and most recently helped work with local racial uh, justice reform groups to get the audit done of the deaths in custody in San Diego County jails. And Dr. Akila Weber has introduced a bill to uh, based on that audit that we had completed. So would love to get your support for San Diego City Council District 2. Thank you. Thank you so much. Don't forget to put your information in the chat, Lori. Always good to see you. Kylie Titano, I think I see your hand up. Yes, it is. Thank you so much. I'll just say a few words. Hi, DWC. How are you all doing tonight? Um, for those of you that don't know me, Kylie Titano, I am a candidate for Congressional District 50 down here in San Diego. Um, first of all, thank you again for rating um, our campaign as qualified back in January. Since then, we have also been endorsed by Run Women Run, San Diego Progressive Dem Club, La Jolla Democratic Club, and also the Blue America organization. And so I just wanted to share that we'll be having our first canvassing event this Saturday, March 26, 9 a.m. in Hillcrest. I'll be sure to put the link to register for that in the in the chat. Um, but thank you so much for all the support that you have given to our campaign. I really appreciate it. One other fun fact before I go, um, with our March 11th deadline to get on the ballot passed, I am the only woman on the ballot for this race, which is a little bit exciting. So um, yeah, I'm looking forward to the next two months. It's sure gonna be a sprint, but with your support, I know that we can get there. So I'll make sure to put my information in the chat. Thank you again. Have a good evening. Thank, thank you so much. Always good to see you. Ilka Weston. That Did was you... actually a mistake, but I okay. heard through the grapevine that Kylie's going to be endorsed by a national uh, group as well. Just hint, okay. hint. Uh, so I might as well. All right, we're going to have to move on, Ilka, because we're really going to be Sorry, tight. It was with a mistake. Time. It was a mistake, but there, there's Kylie thing. Okay. Um, Dave Myers. Hi, Yay, everybody. Dave Myers face. here, running for sheriff. You're endorsed. Democratic Women's Club endorsed candidate for sheriff. I wanted to come on tonight and let everybody know that Susan and John are hosting an event for us. Saturday, March 26th from 11 to 1. It's in the Mount Helix area. I can put some information in the chat a little bit later, but also I hope you all, and I'm going to plug a little uh, thing for Dominic. Dominic wrote an op-ed piece that was published this morning about caring for the Ukrainian refugees. And he told it from a perspective as a refugee himself when he fled Vietnam. Look it up. I'll put it in the chat for you. And Thanks again for your confidence and support in me and endorsing me for sheriff. And thank you for being you, Dave. I really appreciate your consistency. You. 
Make sure you put your information in the chat. All right, Peter Singer. Hey, good evening, and uh, thank you for the opportunity. I'm Peter Singer. I'm running for Superior Court Judge, seat 36. Different seat from Ms. Cantor. We are not running against each other. Um, I am presently a Superior Court Commissioner. I've been a commissioner now. I'm in my seventh year, and I handle uh, primarily criminal infractions and occasionally unlawful detainer and small claims cases. I am also uh, president of the California Court Commissioners Association, which is a statewide organization. Several years back, I was designated as California Court Commissioner of the Year. And again, like uh, Ms. Cantor, she talked about her pro tem service to the court. Prior to my becoming a commissioner full time, I uh, did 22 years as a pro tem judge for the court, also handling small claims and traffic. Um, in my particular race, I am the only one in the race who is not a prosecutor, not a career prosecutor. Um, I also uh, serve as a faculty member of the California Judicial College, where I teach new judges and commissioners who are coming up through the ranks. And I also teach uh, new judge orientation. So I teach all of the mandatory courses required of commissioners and judges who were appointed statewide. Uh, I've been you. very active in the community um, with the Downtown Lions Club, presently in charge of the uh, uh, building that we have on Market Street for uh, low-income seniors. And I wanna thank you for the opportunity. And uh, it's uh, nice to be with you this evening. Okay, thank you so much. And your information is in the chat. David Dodson, you're up. Hi, thank you. Oops, sorry. Please start over, I have, yeah. Am I good? Yeah, I'm you're good, good now. So go yeah, ahead and well, start I, over again. Yes, I just uh, I just tuned in tonight to uh, listen to Malia Cohen, but thank you. I am a candidate running for the Board of Equalization 4th District, which is the district uh, that encompasses San Diego. And um, I'm the most qualified candidate running for the Board of Equalization 4th District. Uh, the board's duties recently returned to its historic duty of administering California's property tax system. So I've worked in property tax assessment at the Board of Equalization for 30 years. I run the Southern California Office of the Board of Equalization, and I, I am committed to using my knowledge in this very specialized field to protect your rights while staying true to my progressive values. This is my life's work. Schools and communities rely on property tax revenues. I want to see robust revenue streams available to solve problems. We have a affordable housing crisis. Homelessness is rampant. So many believe that property tax laws are written in stone. In fact, they change every year. You deserve someone with the knowledge and experience necessary to navigate these changes. I will support laws that encourage the highest level of home, owner occupied home ownership. I will fight against loopholes. I will protect our open space and agricultural heritage. And um, I'm a public servant, I'm not a politician. And I pro I've probably served in the United States Coast Guard. I've been a union member throughout my career. And uh, anyways, I know the Board of Equalization is not always the highest priority for voters. But please, it's important to do your research, uh, make an informed choice. I know that you will find I'm the clear choice. Contact me. I'm always happy to answer any questions. My name is David Dodson. I'm running for the Board of Equalization 4th District. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And please make sure to include your information in the chat. All right, we have about three minutes before um, our visit from Malia Cohen. So if we could move to um, recognition of elected officials or their representatives. Um, if you are in the audience and have, would like to speak, please raise your hand. I see Doug Case. Okay, uh, good evening, I'm Doug Case. I am the local political affairs director for a Senate president uh, pro tem, Tony Atkins. Uh, let me talk briefly about two things. Number one is the uh, skyrocketing cost of gasoline and what is being done about it. Uh, you know, the governor proposed a, uh, a suspension of the uh, gas tax increase, um, but uh, the speaker, Rindon of the assembly and the pro tem uh, have suggested a different approach because uh, going that approach of reducing the uh, or suspending the gas tax number one would not guarantee to be passed along to consumers uh, is not that large amount amount of money it would only be uh, 
$135 over a six month uh, period. Um, and that it jeopardizes uh, some uh, uh, roadway projects that have already been approved. Uh, what they are suggesting instead is that the excess in the general fund that we're gonna have this year, uh, that there be a tax rebate for uh, Californians who are affected by not only the high cost of gasoline, but the cost of food and everything else that is affected by that. Um, some of the assembly members have proposed a $400 uh, a tax uh, rebate. Um, the uh, budget chiefs for the assembly and the uh, state senate are recommending uh, $200 per person uh, in, in a household um, up to, uh, and would only include those households who earn less than $250,000. But uh, there's still discussion as to what, what route they're going to take, uh, but rest assured that the legislature is assuring that uh, there will be some relief uh, to uh, Californians. Uh, secondly, I want to talk about uh, the issue of uh, Senator Atkins' uh, Bill SB 1375, uh, which deals with nurse practitioners. Uh, it amends uh, two previous bills dealing with nurse practitioners uh, in two ways, but uh, the, the issue is that there is a severe shortage of uh, primary health care conditions in the state of California, and in particular, 40% uh, of California counties don't have uh, any uh, abortion clinics. Uh, this bill would address that in two ways. Number one, it would uh, specify as the uh, length of time that a nurse practitioner would need to work under the direction of a physician in order to work independently at three years, and they could apply previous service toward that. And uh, secondly, it would include in the list of services that a nurse practitioner would be permitted to perform independently uh, abortions during the first trimester. So that would address both of those problems. And I look forward to uh, keeping you abreast of how those two uh, issues, as well as other issues, uh, proceed in the legislature. So thank you for the time. Thank you so much. It looks like um, we still have a couple few minutes. So I guess what I could do is talk a little bit about Women's History Month, which I think um, has been going fabulously, um, not only have we been recognizing things that have happened historically? Um, we are making history even this month. Um, I'm really excited about our program speaker um, this evening, and I won't go into her entire bio because I want to do that right before I introduce her. But I do want to really give her kudos for accomplishing um, something that people said couldn't be done. And I think that, you know, if you want to, what do they say, if you want to get something really hard done, um, you ask a woman to do it. And she did. And so now I feel kind of weird because I had the time ready and set aside and I don't want to interrupt Secretary Rodriguez once she gets started. So I'm going to ask a really weird question. Does anybody in the audience have anything that they'd like to share? That's like maybe a one or two minute thing. Oh, okay, Lori, please. <laughs> Perfect, you read my mind. <laughs> so, well, I was thinking today as I listened to the, um, uh, the Senate Judiciary Committee, how historic today is getting started on this hearing. And it reminded me of when um, Karen Bass became speaker of the California Assembly. And she was the first, not only the first Democratic woman speaker, there had briefly been a Republican woman, that's a long story, um, but it turned out she was the first Black woman elected speaker of a state legislature in the nation's history. The first in the nation's history for a Black woman to serve as the speaker of a state legislative body. And so it was um, a tremendous ceremony when she was sworn in. And then when I was sworn in as her pro tem to be the presiding officer, it was again historic. It was the first time in California history that two women held those constitutional offices at the same time together as the speaker and the pro tem. So uh, sometimes history is not that long ago. And uh, likewise, today we are seeing history in the making. So uh, thank you, Luana, for, for letting me share that. All right, thank you. And then I see Elise Pipkin Allen's hand, and you know I, we could never ignore that hand ever. You have to unmute though, so everybody can hear you. 
You're still muted. Try hitting the space bar. Oh, there we go. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I wasn't on the meeting earlier, so you may have already announced this, that uh, Sunday we had the inaugural meeting for an organization that we're calling BAR, which is for Black and African Women Rise Democratic Club. And some of you who are on this on now, we're there. We want you to know, thank you so much for coming. We appreciate you. We had a nice turnout and we're having really positive uh, comments about the club. Uh, and the club is going to be collaborating with the Democratic Women's Club and also the NLK Democratic Club. So thank everybody that came. Uh, it was a great day and I, I really appreciate your support. Yeah, in fact, I will say it was at the bar meeting that I had a chance to co connect with Malia Cohen. So just the fact that, um, you know, they they started off, we started off, I can't say they, because I am a member and um, it's just started off this way with um, having um, illustrious speakers and um, just being really relevant and current. So I'm really grateful for everybody here that was able to join us there. Thank you. And I see Regina Evans in the audience. Um, Regina, is Malia with you or are we still waiting for her to join? Hi, good evening. I just signed on myself. I'm making contact with her now and I will provide you an update shortly. Okay, thank you. All right, and so, um, with that, um, do we have any other hands from anyone else? Do, do, do. You know, most of the business that we have on the agenda later is going to um, be a little bit longer. And so I don't wanna, um, I guess we could get started with some things. Um, yeah. Well, while we're waiting and you're all here, I will say that um, today we are, you know, we did, um, well, I don't wanna take away anyone else's report either, um, but I encourage everyone to consider getting involved and um, yay, I don't have to stall. <laughs> um, welcome to the meeting, um, Honorable Malia Cohen. Thank you. Um, and are you ready? <sighs> Honey, I was born ready. I'm ready. I know you were. Do you want me to read like just your bio? Pass or me the baton. Just, huh? Just pass me the baton, doctor. You got it. Dr. Richmond. Well, there are a lot of people that are here just because they knew they heard you were going to be here. <laughs> sure. Dr. Richmond, can you um spotlight her or pin her or whichever thing it is? Yes, I can. Absolutely. All right, here we go. Okay, here we go. Thank you. I'm glad we were able to make this happen. I just learned of this meeting yesterday. And so I'm really grateful for you squeezing me on the agenda. May I ask how much time do I have? You have 10 minutes. Oh, my goodness. And that includes some time for questions. Oh, okay, yes. I mean, it's up to you. If you go the whole 10 minutes, it's good. But if you want people to ask no, you no. questions. <laughs> no, no, no. I got to get I got to go cook dinner and I got to get my baby in the bed. So you're right. 10 minutes. OK, so let's go. I'm excited to be able to present myself to you. I'm a candidate running for state controller. And I'm going to tell you that when I started this uh, journey, uh, March of last year, I had no idea I would be standing here just with so much momentum. And I'm very grateful for all the support that I've had, particularly coming down from San Diego. I mean, just San Diego was just a beautiful a beautiful part of the state of California, but just I've met so many really wonderful people with wonderful personal stories. And as I listen to these stories, I'm just thinking about how the controller's office can enter what uh, I can enter a weave there's my, my, my personal story as well as the controller's office into your life. So the controller is an important function, um, ladies. The controller is the chief fiscal officer for the state of California, and she has many different functions, one of which is the ability to audit. And if anyone has ever ever gone through an audit, you know that it is no joke. A performance audit would tell you what you're doing well and it will tell you what you are doing poorly. And so we need to be consistent about who we're auditing. And that is something that's very important to me. 
equity. Equity. Now, San Diego, you've done a fantastic job on getting the uh, closing the gap on resources for COVID-19, right? I, when I was just down there two weeks ago, I saw all different signs where people could get, get tested, where people can get information. I know you were doing working really hard on getting PPP out to people in multiple languages. And so I think that we have a shared value there. One of the first things I want to work on as controller is not only getting our accounting system called the fiscal system up and operational, because it's been broken quite frankly, for the last 11 years. I'm going to de dedicate time and energy and develop a strike team to get in there and do it. We can do it. We just haven't had the political will and, um, you know, the challenge out there. So that is the first thing that I'm going to work on. The second thing I want to work on is putting a translate button on the controller's website. It's a simple, easy concept, but you wouldn't believe the resistance. We need to make sure that the information that's on the, that the, that's on the controller's website, it's dense, but it's, it needs to be accessible to everyone and all persons that have walk in life. Um, the controller sits on 78 different boards and commissions. So if you are an environmentalist, you would be concerned about what the controller is doing because she sits on the state lands commission and the coastal commission and offshore and onshore drilling are very big issues, particularly in Southern California. And you need to have someone that I believe is like-minded that wouldn't necessarily be open to the, the further exploitation of Natural, a fuel, fossil fuel, but let alone decimating our natural resources. If you are a retired employee or a current state employee, the controller sits on the CalPERS and CalSTRS. This is the two largest in pension funds in the world. And I believe that these pension funds need to be fully vested, uh, fully funded, and that they, they should continue to exist so that people, when they retire, they can retire comfortably on, and, uh, on um, the money that they put away and that they've saved and that they've earned. So this is just a few of the highlights of the role that the controller um, serves in. Uh, in my capacity now, I'm chair of the California Board of Equalization. It's an $80 billion property tax agency. I represent 23 counties, 10 million people. I'm sad to say I do not represent you, San Diego County, but excited to say that I still travel and my chief of staff represent San Diego County. So my counties are from Santa Barbara all the way north, all the way to the top of the state to a tiny county that you probably have never been to or heard of called Del Norte. It's a lovely place, but it's a, it's a, it's a hike to get to. But nonetheless, being able to represent rural communities, urban communities, communities where English is a second language, agricultural communities, has afforded me an opportunity to have a very unique purview. And I think that this distinguishes me from other candidates in this race. Another distinguishing factor is, is that I'm the endorsed candidate for the California Democratic Party. Democrats got together two weeks ago and said, we support you, Malia Cohen, to the tune of 62.3%. And you need a 60% threshold. And the next closest competitor only got 30%. But I'm not here to give shade. I'm only here to be positive and to uplift. So I am going to pivot and I'm going to see if there's any questions. No question is, is too small and no question is too broad. So let me see what you got. All right, raise those hands. Come on, don't be shy. Oh, Lori Saldana always has great questions. <laughs> okay. Uh, hi, uh, thank you for joining us. I am a retired teacher. And uh, one of the things about CalSTRS is we are seeing more and more members over age 100. Mm. And um, when I was in the legislature and they tried to defund CalSTRS, we did our research and found out that not only do women live longer than men, women teachers live on average longer than women in average. So um, how are you going to plan for all of this, um, our aging population, and uh, especially when women teachers are living to be over 100 in more and more cases? What's the long term? Well, this, this is... I think one of the benefits of being a part of such a, a rich state, right? Um, I am going to continue to support these teachers. They have dedicated their lives. Matter of fact, I've come to this profession because of my teacher. My third grade teacher introduced me to, um, to public life and the concept of running for office. And we will continue to invest prudently, long-term investments, being very smart about the investment strategies that we are employing so that we can support our 100-year-old teachers. Um, the, um, I don't know what more else I could say, I mean, without giving too much into the investment strategy that as a fiduciary, I'm not able to, to share everything, um, but that is where my priorities would be. Thank you, Lori. 
All right, do we have any additional questions? Oh, Ilka. Well, hello. Um, thank you so much for being here. I have to tell you that you have a room full of people and a lot of people are really excited about you. David Dotson's a big fan. Gary Gardner is a big fan. Yeah, you, you got it. So I do have a question um, right now and I'll bring it up. It's around schools. Lori uh, Saldana, who's running for uh -huh. District 2, made me think of it. When you're looking at um, the uh, voucher system, right? Mm. And we're looking at the vouchers going into private schools. So now mm -hmm. we're having a lot of public schools shut down, which is very yes. important that we support our neighborhood public schools. How and uh, in which direction are you able to help assist that way? Because that's the biggest complaint I hear from voters is when their neighborhood school is shut down and they need to rely on it. I couldn't agree more with you. And this is something I want to highlight for you that is not just in San Diego County, Alameda County, San Francisco County, we are all dealing with this. Um, and with that, I want to acknowledge that I have been endorsed and do have the support of Tony Thurman, um, as well as several of the statewide teachers union. CTA hasn't, hasn't come on board just yet, but uh, CFT and CFA are, have both endorsed. Um, so there is, there is a piece of legislation uh, that is working its way through the assembly, and you have to forgive me, I do not recall, I think it's Assembly Bill 1400, if I'm not mistaken. No, that's that was Ash Cholera's. Yeah, that was healthcare, but. That was healthcare, you're right. And I am on the record to support that. But there is a piece of legislation that's, that will, that's working its way through the legislature. Um, it's co-sponsored by Mia Bonta, who's an assemblywoman out of yeah. Alabama County, right? And it would change the formula on how public schools receive their money. Now, uh, I am supportive of that of that legislation because we it would again change the formula and how they read their, receive their money, not based on attendance, right? And I think that's where schools get uh, locked up. Now, the other thing is the Board of Equalization, the work that I do on a daily basis. I represent and work on a system that is um, that collects $80 billion in property taxes. And property taxes are the number one way public schools get their money. Yeah. So making sure that this property tax system is fair and efficient. And most importantly, big um, properties, property property. Um, um, property owners like Amazon or PG&E or um, what's down in your area? Um, the uh, PG&E. Yes, the utility company down in San Diego, making sure that they are paying their fair share. So, so what does that mean? That means that there are no loopholes that their lawyers have found, and making sure that that they are that everything is is being set. That's incredibly important. Um, and the controller sits on the board of equalization in that respect. So, those are two ways that I have been helping. Um, when it comes to voucher system, I do understand the complexity of it. I'm a public school kid myself. I'm a pro public school person. Support the teachers and the teachers union and am not interested in seeing any system that, um, that is systematically dismantling. Vouchers take money out of our public school system. Um, they're able to pick the creme de la creme student. So that means that they're passing over the students with IEPs or special educational plans and leaving them to languish um, in the public school system because those dollars that we would use to educate them are now going into the voucher system. So it's not a system that I'm supportive. Um, many folks in the charter amendment and in the charter space do not support me as a candidate. And so just wanna be very public and transparent about that. All right, Gary Gardner. Wait, I think Weston, Ms. Weston has another question, but she's still muted. I was just gonna say, I was a proud delegate who voted for you. So thank you very much. I'm glad I you're definitely. here. Thank Great. you. Gary thank Gardner. You. Hi there, Maria. How are Hi. you? Good. Hi. You. Um, so, so I've known you for, I don't know, 12 or 15 years. I'd love for you to share, because most of the folks here are just getting to know you. Um, when you were a member of the San Francisco Board of Supervisors for eight years and president of the San Francisco Board of Supervisors, what are some, what are two of the most proud accomplishments? I know you did a lot of things there. Mm -hmm, You've mm -hmm. done, you know, you worked on a lot of different issues that impact women, children, et cetera. So I'm wondering if you might share just that background. And then you recently were on the police commission in San Francisco and working on, on racial justice issues as well. Yes, you're right, Gary. I have been busy and have had my hand in a lot of pots, folks. So Gary referenced the police commission. It's a police reform work that I'm very proud of. I started this reform uh, and this reform mindedness, quite honestly, in 2014. This was when I was running for re-election, uh, but I remember being at an event 
uh, at Don Ramones, by the way, if anyone is in San Francisco, visit Don Ramones. I highly recommend this uh, restaurant. Um, and I got a, police, a call from the chief of police, who was Greg Sir at the time, and he said there was an officer involved shooting, um, and they killed a guy. Um, and it turns out they riddled his body with 22 bullets. And after four years of dealing with officer involved shootings, I just couldn't take it anymore. And I began to look at to how these investigations were unfolding. So the police department came back and told me that, hey, uh, this kid was yielding a knife and therefore the officers, um, and there were 11 of them that were called to the scene. Uh, they were all in fear for their life, unleashed 22 bullets. And it turns out this was a kid that was just having, he was 22 years old and having a mental break. And we're talking about a butter knife. So I said, you know what, no longer should we let these police officers investigate themselves. So we, we totally reformed the system in San Francisco from the top down. We changed the way um, the officer, the office, the, citizen, the office of citizen complaint, we changed the name to the Department of Police Accountability. We gave audit authority to the, the, to the DPA so that they could go in every year, do an audit of the police department's spending and their use of force policies and come back and report back to us and tell us what they found. And I'm going to tell you, the first audit that they conducted as a result of my legislation, one, one won an award, and two has resulted in less officer-involved shootings consistently in the last two years in San Francisco history. And this is a perfect example of how an audit, when implemented and put into action, has changed policy. And so this is a big deal when we're talking about police reform across the entire state. This is a bellwether moment, and I want to continue to push. Now, the controller sits on the um, Victims' Compensation Fund, uh, which is a fund of state dollars that um, helps people who have been victimized by crime put their lives back together. And so this is something that I want to elevate. This is not commonly known, and I want to make sure that this, is, this resource is available to people that, that have been touched by crime. Um, the other two pieces of legislation that stands out to my mind where I actually put a lot of fight in, and it was a classic you know, David and Goliath, um, classic David and Goliath, uh, a, a setup. Um, uh, Gary, you'll have to help me find a, a nice Jewish reference about when the small guy gave and took on the big, the big industry. But what we did in San Francisco is we took on the sugary beverage industry. And we said that we were no longer going to let them just dictate to us um, and, and sugar added to our diet, the number one way the vehicle is used through soda. And the other industry that we took on was the, was the um, tobacco industry. The tobacco industry admitted to marketing to LGBTQ community members, communities of color, specifically African-American and Latino. Why? Because they labeled us as vulnerable community members. And I was insulted and offended by that. And I said, let's do something about this. So we went and we, we, we said, listen, you're not gonna be able to sell menthol cigarettes to our people and flavored tobacco to our people anymore. And we won, and this is an initiative that the tobacco industry is still fighting. There's going to be an initiative on the ballot in November to, to repeal the ban that state legislators put in place a couple of years ago. So I'm just going to inoculate you right now to look for that. We are not gonna let the tobacco industry dictate to us what, why, who they're going to target. The reason why they want to addict young people when it comes to flavors is because they are running out of people to get addicted to their nicotine. We'll, I'll come back and talk to you a little bit more about that. But those, those are three issues, Gary, that you spoke of that I, that I am proud of that we did do in San Francisco that has had statewide implications. Thank you, Elka. All right. So thank you so much. I know that you've got another call you've got to run to. One, I, I, as a process engineer, we always say what you measure is what people hold themselves accountable to. And so the power of the audit is much stronger than people realize. My question is really simple. Can you share your hashtag with us for people that want to support you on social media? God. One question I can't even answer. I have to get so that. Maybe Regina can help us. But maybe, if not, you can send it to us later. Knows it. Let me, okay. Oh, yes, I'm going to find it and we will put it in the chat, Dr. Richmond. I don't want to hold up time and, and even pretend like I even know what it is because I don't. But the delegates know because I, I, I know we used it during um, the delegate time. But I will tell you my website is um, <laughs> maliacohen.us and I will put that in the chat as well. And I'm going to put my email in there so you can contact me directly. It's been a joy to present myself to you. I hope you will continue to um, support me and support this opportunity to really change the face of leadership in the state of California. Good night, everyone. My name is Malia. Thank you.
All right. Okay, back to gallery view. That was that was a lot. I, I think I may have gone over a little bit, but I was fascinated. Sorry. It's it's really hard to regulate a meeting while also being enthralled. Um, <laughs> so now, um, without any further delay, um, are there any member? Did any members have anything else they wanted to say before we move on? Okay. So moving on. Um, if Malia or Regina could put information in the chat for people that want to follow up, and I did have a member ask how they can help, and I think having that I'm information. Trying to, is but you've disabled the chat, so I'm going to have to send it to you. Yeah, and then I'll put it. Yeah, send it to me, and then I'll share it out to everyone. Yeah, I'm 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 doing it now. Okay. okay. All right. Perfect. Um, Elise. Hi, Elise. Elise, you got to unmute again. I was okay. just wondering if we are going to be endorsing in this race. That is an excellent question. Because I vote yes. <laughs> well, if the club agrees, we could put that on the agenda for our April meeting, and we could look at there. There are actually three can three Democratic candidates running. Mm -hmm. um, Ron Galperin, Galperin that we uh, heard speak in at our February meeting, Malia Cohen, we heard today, and then there is a third candidate, her name is Yvonne Yu. Um, and we would not you know, invite her to come and speak for 10 minutes, we would just follow our normal uh, endorsement process. So, so I guess maybe if we just had a real quick show of hands, if the, if the membership is interested, then the endorsement- Is there a motion? Do you want was there a motion from Elise? That was a motion by Elise and Dave Myers seconded it. All right, all in Thank favor you, say aye. 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 Um, any opposed say nay. So Doug has his hand up. Yes, Doug. I'm sorry, I was raising my hand because you said if you wanted to support it, raise your hand, so. Okay, okay. all right, so that's a yes. Um, I didn't hear any nays. Um, it looks like we will be endorsing in April, so be aye. prepared to endorse. Right. So I, I, need to, yeah, I surely need to have Malia's actual email that will get a questionnaire to her and she will see it. So not just the candidate one on the, on the, okay. on the website. All right, I'll do what I can to help with that. And I'll, you know, I'll reach okay. out to Regina and I think you have Regina's information also. She All gave, right. she gave well, me her phone I just wanted yesterday. to let you know that the uh, hashtag is hashtag Malia Cohen or hashtag Hashtag Team Malia. <laughs> That's good. Thank you, Gary. Sure. Can always count on you for, for information. Well, the internet. All right. So if, if you're all ready, okay, so we've got lots of information here. Doo -doo -doo -doo. Da -da -da -da. I'm just pasting information in the chat. And um, all right, so now on to our program um, in honor of International Women's History Month. It is, it is my pleasure, honor, and great joy to welcome the cabinet secretary of New Mexico's higher education, um, Secretary Rodriguez, our hometown hero, um, Stephanie Rodriguez is the cabinet secretary of the New Mexico Higher Education Department and was appointed by the first Democratic Latina governor in the United States, another woman making history. She was confirmed by the New Mexico State Senate unanimously last year, and her academic background is in architecture and urban design with a focus on physical planning, universal inclusive design, and ADA practices from the University of New Mexico. She worked in Congress and state government in the arena of public policy, and her portfolio included education, migration, military affairs, and the National Defense Laboratories. Secretary Rodriguez is now working to implement the most inclusive and encompassing tuition-free college package in the state of New Mexico while lobbying countrywide support to pass a package at the national level for all Americans and residents in the United States. 
She is one of the youngest cabinet secretaries, one of only a handful of Latinx women and a daughter of immigrants. And I will let her share more with you. Um, Stephanie Rodriguez, Secretary Rodriguez, I am looking for you in the screen so that I can spotlight you. I'm hoping that you will turn your video on so people can I see do. your beautiful face. Madam President, Dr. Mick Richman, I do have my video on. Oh, you know what? There's two instances of you. <laughs> yes. Um, ignore the other one. That's my iPad. Okay. Gotcha. We're ready. You're spotlighted. Perfect. And I'm not able to share my screen, but I did share my presentation. Would I'm you like to share your screen? Yes, that would be fantastic. Thank you. I know what it's like to try to do a presentation and someone else is controlling it. It's very tough. We're both in the higher education arena, so we understand that. Yeah, so now I'm just trying to find the little button so that I can... Um... And if you could allow the um, other Stephanie Rodriguez to share that doesn't have my camera on, that would be fantastic, Dr. Richmond. Okay. And while that's okay. going on, um, yes, I am Stephanie Rodriguez and I am the cabinet secretary of the New Mexico Higher Education Department. So how it works in New Mexico, we have three education cabinet secretaries, one dedicated to early childhood, one dedicated to pre-K through 12th grade, and then higher education, which is me. Oh, I did the wrong one. <laughs> no worries. As you all know, Zoom is finicky, so we're all still trying to live through this. Okay, there we go. You're all set now. Perfect. I love your background, by the way. Thank you. I'm hiding in my bedroom since I'm not in my office anymore. I apologize, everyone. I got a new system that I'm trying to use. No, I did ask my sister if she can be a presenter. Nadia, can you pull up my presentation for me? I can. Give me one minute. I'm sorry, everyone. Oh, I forgot to mention um, our, our, our special guest is also Nadia's sister. And just like our previous speaker, I'm sure that this is gonna be well worth the wait. So Nadia, go ahead and double click that PDF. Nadia, are you working with one screen or two? Go ahead and do full screen mode, Nod. Bottom left-hand corner. 
is way harder than it looks. There we go. There we go. <laughs> All right. So although we work in higher education, as you can tell, we still have technical difficulties with technology. So with that, good evening. Thank you, Madam President, Dr. Richmond, for the opportunity to be here tonight and present on a transformational shift on higher education that we're really extremely proud of in the state of New Mexico. And I don't know what my sister is doing, so I apologize. <laughs> so anyway, while that's being figured out, from colleague to colleague in higher education, Dr. Richmond, I'm grateful that you and I have a shared set of values centered on students, where we would rather serve our students than a nickel and dime approach that is common amongst college and university administrations that we see in our state a lot of times. So as I said, I'm Stephanie Rodriguez and I'm the cabinet secretary of the New Mexico Higher Education Department. I've been in this role for a little over a year and a half now. And I was appointed by Governor Michelle Lujan Grisham, the first Hispanic Democratic governor in the United States. Um, but I have to say that I'm probably better known in my hometown where I was born and raised as Nadia's little sister, Steffi. So a lot of times when I go home, I'm usually in Nadia's shadow. Um, I have been asked to present on the Opportunity Scholarship, which is now cemented in statute. We worked extremely hard during our legislative session to create, aid, and pass a bipartisan tuition-free college affordability package. And now we are serving as the national model as the Biden administration and the US Department of Education continues free to your college conversations at the national level. We believe that every New Mexican deserves the opportunity to reach higher. Whether you're a returning adult learner, a working parent, a recent high school graduate, somebody with a GED, or someone who started college but did not finish, the Opportunity Scholarship is for you. So Nadia, I'm just gonna have you, since there's technical difficulties, just stay on our promise, and then I'll tell you when to scroll down. Um, but that would be great. So the next slide, which says our promise, is the New Mexico Higher Education Department, and this is the case in a lot of states, has historically been an agency dedicated to the fiduciary responsibilities and appropriation passed through to our colleges and universities. However, under Michelle Lujan Grisham, our governor, we have turned a new page to be dedicated to the people we ultimately serve, which are our students and our families. And in order to support students and foster spaces for success in academics and beyond, we need to ensure that there is financial support and student support services that are in place at our colleges and universities in New Mexico. Because without financial support and without student services, a student will not finish and graduate college. Now, I also want to note in this presentation, these are not stock photos. These are actually New Mexicans that are students and graduates of our university. And we're really proud of every single individual that is in this presentation today. Go ahead and scroll down to the next slide titled Lottery Scholarship. New Mexico made history. In 1996, a lot of people don't know this, but we were the first state in the nation to tell high school students that they could go to college tuition free. But there are so many New Mexicans of all ages and backgrounds who could benefit from higher education, but simply can't afford it. The state of New Mexico made history again, you've seen us around on the news, by telling all New Mexicans that they can go to college for free. We now have the most accessible tuition-free college program in the United States. And we are ensuring that New Mexicans can gain the skills that they need to enter into family sustaining careers right here at home. An interesting fact we found out when we took on this challenge was that the average age of a college student in the state of New Mexico if any one of you were to guess, I can guarantee that more than half of you would say 23 years old, 22 years old, 21 years old, it's actually 26 years old. So if we think about that in context, our demographic of a student is actually quite higher than the traditional 18 year old right out of high school. 
Nadia, go ahead and scroll over to Opportunity Scholarship and don't worry about putting it in full screen mode anymore, sister. We're good, we can see it. <laughs> we received 75 million for tuition-free college in 2022 this year, so that up to 35,000 New Mexicans can pursue career training certificates and college degrees right here. Now, what's great about the Opportunity Scholarship is its accessibility and its encompassing. This is very unique to our program too. Both part-time and full-time students are eligible, meaning if you need to work and go to school, you can do that. You can go to school part-time. If you would like to only focus on school and finish in the four years you need to, well, you can do that and focus on school and go full-time. All someone has to do to remain eligible is establish residency in the state of New Mexico and be an established resident and maintain a 2.5 GPA during his, her, or their time in college. You can be any age and it can be used to earn a certificate, associate, or bachelor's degree. Go ahead and scroll down. So a lot of times when you hear people like me or democratic governors, you will often hear what we call their stump speeches, talk about equity and how it's the capstone of democracy and the Democratic Party. However, you have to put words into action. When we hear those stump speeches, always make sure that there's action. So when we first entered the administration in 2019, we actually noticed that our four tribal colleges, we have four in the state of New Mexico that are dedicated to serving Native American students, were not included in our original tuition-free college program, the Lottery Scholarship. So we created a landscape of discrepancies of how New Mexico was treating tribal colleges and Native American students versus the rest of our public higher education landscape and institutions. So at the time I was a senior advisor to the governor and she pulled me into her office and she said, we are passing a law that says that any tribal college, so that any student that is enrolled in their class in their school or from a nationally recognized tribal nation could benefit from the lottery scholarship tuition free. And that was over 2000 students. And this promise will of course extend to our newly established opportunity scholarship. Go ahead and go to the next slide. Now you're hearing me talk about two programs and you're probably thinking, why do you have two programs for tuition-free college? Well, same, <laughs> but the legislature required the governor and me in negotiations behind the scenes to keep the original tuition-free college program established in 1996 that focused on those recent high school graduates and create a new program on top of that for the rest of the constituency based in New Mexico. But if you look at your screen, the Opportunity Scholarship is more encompassing and more inclusive. Any New Mexican with a high school diploma or equivalency without a bachelor's degree is eligible. Part-time and full-time, which is unique to our program, is an option and includes training certificates in career technical education and vocational education programs. And the last important point is it includes both tuition and fees. So a lot of our college promise programs across the nation only consider tuition, but we also stack fees on top of coverage in the Opportunity Scholarship. Go ahead and scroll down. Now I wanna provide you with some context. So I gave you that initial background, but let's talk about the dynamics and landscape of New Mexico's higher education. We have 29 colleges and universities, not as much as California, I know, but that's a lot for me, trust me. All of which are minority serving public colleges and universities in the state. Once again, they are all minority serving colleges and universities. 24 are Hispanic serving institutions with one working towards that title and four are tribal colleges dedicated to the education, representation, preservation, and academics of Native American culture, language, and history. The state of New Mexico is a proud minority majority state or people of the global majority, as I like to say. 
We also have a large rural demographic, hence why we have many colleges and universities in rural New Mexico. Of our population of 21, 2.1 million, over 700,000 of our residents live in rural communities. And luckily there's a college within the radius that they can actually go to. Nearly half of our residents identify as Hispanic, Latino, or Latinx, and 10% as Native American, and more than 32% of our population speaks Spanish or a Native American language, such as the Navajo language, Diné, in their home. And we are also, by the Constitution, a bilingual state in English and Spanish. Next slide. Now I'm gonna to continue to talk about this higher education landscape, but I'm gonna move on to another data point that you all should always consider when you're looking at tuition-free college programs, and that's education attainment. Governor Lujan Grisham's administration continues to build upon investments made in education at all levels, from cradle to career. And in that commitment, we are diligently working to close access and degree attainment maps that exist in New Mexico, which you gaps, not maps, sorry, gaps that exist in New Mexico, which you can see on your screen. Um, as we're doing this, particularly among at-risk and non-traditional students are often not represented in higher education landscapes, but deserve access in the front door. And that's the demographic that we're really looking to benefit in the Opportunity Scholarship. So we're making progress in increasing the edu educational attainment through tuition-free college programs, but we lag in comparison to California and the national average of 51.9% for educational attainment past an associate degree. New Mexico's attainment rate is only 48%. However, that is significantly jolted because we're home of Los Alamos National Laboratories, and we also have the highest PhD per capita within that county alone in the whole entire United States. So when we think about degree attainment and we take out Los Alamos National Labs, we're actually way below 40% in degree attainment past an associate degree. Now, why do we have to pay attention to this? Well, that's because by 2025, 60% of adults in the United States will need some credential beyond high school. In New Mexico alone in our state, in the past 10 years, we have added 10,000 new jobs with an average salary of $90,000. But most of these jobs require some level of education beyond high school, and that's where tuition-free college kicks in. And unfortunately, we're not filling those jobs with New Mexicans. We need New Mexicans to fill our economic and workforce needs. We need students to stay in our state for college and their careers, and to do that, we found the need to invest in these students. I promise I'm almost done. Next slide. So I wanna talk about the main attraction. I gave you that landscape and background, but the Opportunity Scholarship. To date, over 10,000 Opportunity Scholarships have been administered in our past sessions, but with the infusion of $75 million this year, we're looking to triple or potentially quadruple that number in fall 2022. In the very first year of implementation, we saw 64% of the participants were females. A lot of them were actually work, uh, mothers going back to school. 36% were male. The oldest participant in our program was 74 years young. The youngest in the scholarship program was 19 years old and the average age of participants was 25 years old. Additionally, 60% of the students identified as Hispanic followed by 21% white, not of Hispanic origin, and 12% Native American. Now, as you can see by all these demographics alone, the scholarship is already creating pathways for students traditionally forgotten or not targeted in recruitment within the higher education sphere. Go ahead and scroll down. Now, we briefly touched on this, but it doesn't hurt to discuss it again. Eligibility has been the number one question coming from CNN, the New York Times, CNN, the New York Times, the Huffington Post, all the way to everyday New Mexicans calling our agency. This is extremely exciting because this piece of legislation 
is so accessible and encompassing in which all 29 public higher education institutions and tribal colleges are eligible to receive the funding for the scholarship. Two, students must be an established New Mexico resident, enroll part-time at a minimum, and maintain a 2.5 GPA during their time in college. And go ahead and jump to the next slide. And three, the Opportunity Scholarship covers tuition and required student fees and for any New Mexico resident. So like I said, someone can be working toward a certificate in a high demand field or trade in their community, an associate degree or bachelor's degree. Now, what is unique about this program compared to the rest of the nation, and I keep saying that a lot because it's so encompassing, but if someone enrolled in college, but did not finish due to a family situation, couldn't finish it, finances, they can re-enroll in the Opportunity Scholarship and at our universities and earn up to a bachelor's degree. We have so many New Mexicans in this state who actually started college but did not finish. It's upwards of 30%. And we wanna make sure that those students can get a foot in the door, upskill, reskill, retool, and re-enter our workforce. And go ahead and go to the next slide. So I'm working with my team in the next steps to establish roles and we're encouraging New Mexicans to apply and enroll in school for college. And for the time being, folks can visit our advocacy and grassroots campaign for the Opportunity Scholarship at ReachHireNM.com. We are transitioning the page to reflect the legislation that was passed and to create links for New Mexicans to apply to college directly on the screen. Now, Nadia, I think that was supposed to be a video. I don't know if it's working, but I can just send it later. But we had a local Albuquerque native, Manuel Gonzalez, write a poem. And we also got students to do an amazing and beautiful video to get folks excited to advocate for the Opportunity Scholarship during the legislative session. Because believe it or not, we had to do a lot of fighting on both sides of the aisle to get this passed. And go ahead and jump to the last slide, Nadia. And my last note before I close this presentation is a college education is valuable. I am a testament to that. But unfortunately, most students and families cannot afford the cost of college and make ends meet at the same time. 40% of high school students stated in a national survey that they believe they couldn't afford the cost of a college education. Therefore, they do not think they could enroll or apply. That is why New Mexico is paying the tuition and fees for our students. As I stated earlier, people need a foot in the door. The money we invest in these students will significantly return to the state when they start earning better wages and entering careers with their degree. The Opportunity Scholarship is less than 1% of the state's overall budget and does not increase taxes whatsoever for, every, whatsoever for everyday New Mexicans. These investments are what make a difference for our children. I see my niece and nephew were on here earlier and our family members and our neighbors. And I'm extremely grateful to be part of a bold movement and shift in higher education and our little state, believe it or not, beat the federal government to the punch for a free college package because we in the state of New Mexico believe in our fellow New Mexicans. And I'm really, really hoping my home state of California will follow suit relatively soon. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and put it back to you, Dr. Richmond, Madam President, for the rest of the presentation. Can you hear me now? Okay, perfect. So um, Nadia, if you could stop sharing. I think it stopped sharing. Can you oh. still hear it? Um, no, I'm just getting a weird view. That's all. You're muted, Dr. Richard. And Stephanie, I'm going to unspotlight you very soon. <laughs> uh, I know what it's like to be in the hot seat. And I, I see, oh, I see hands. So Stephanie, you're not out of the hot seat yet. <laughs> yeah, um, you're up for answering questions if that's in order, Dr. Richmond. 
Yeah, I would love to hear your question, especially considering your role with the children's cocktails. <laughs> so we all have that in common, the love of education. So I'm Ann Crosby and I'm the chair of the Children's Caucus of the California Democratic Party. And one of the things we have seen in California is the lack of growth in our university system, which means that our students are going out of state and um, making, availing themselves of the WUI, uh, the Western Alliance uh, of universities. So my question to you is, at what point do they become eligible? How long does it become, how long does it take for them to become eligible um, as residents? Yeah, so there's two pathways. The first is graduating or receiving your high school equivalency from the state of New Mexico from a high school, right? The second one is establishing that residency, which you just mentioned, you must live in the state of New Mexico for 12 consecutive months at a bare minimum. You have to prove that you are living in New Mexico with a mortgage or you're paying rent. And you also have to provide the financial, the finances to show that you're paying your bills, such as electricity, gas, phone, things of that nature has to be proven and documented in our state. That is such a short period of time. I think when, last time I looked, I think Oregon, it was at least two years, if not longer than that. And same for Washington. So I think, uh, I, I hope that California goes, follows suit because I think we're just gonna continue to lose our students to un, other states that are planning so well, such as yours. Thank you. Such as our esteemed guest, right? <laughs> That's right. I know. I'm so sorry, everyone. I left. It's so expensive in California. Yeah, well, you're doing great things. So, you know, maybe you will set the trend, set the tone, and show the way for everyone else. Sarah Davis, I see your hand, please. Thank you so much for joining us and for your presentation. Um, would you mind sharing like one or two of the big um, like topics or hurdles in the legislature, especially with Democrats, so that we can learn from that? Yes, thank you so much for the question. Okay, where do I start? There were a lot of hurdles. I think the main contention point for our legislature is in the state of New Mexico, we don't have a large budget like in California. Our state general fund that we get every single year is anywhere from $6 billion to $8.5 billion. This year was our highest uh, state budget that we've ever had in history at $8.5 billion. But because of that, a lot of our legislators still believe our budget is very, very small. So therefore, a $75 million, $85 million price tag gave them a lot of heartburn. On top of that, we had to prove with data how much this was needed. So my team and I had to go to the drawing board every single day. And that's why I threw a lot of data and information and stats at you because I had to prove to them that this was an investment worth making. So the number one issue I would say was the money. Both Democrats and Republicans did not want to front the money. As a matter of fact, I'm really disappointed that 63 million of the $75 million request is non-recurring funds. So if anyone doesn't know what that means, it means I don't get that money next year. I have to fight for it. I don't get it automatically. So money was the biggest thing. I'd say the second biggest thing is people kept in, you know, Dr. Richmond, you may hear this in higher education a lot. I know I do. Skin in the game. Students need to have skin in the game and they need to pay their tuition and fees so they understand the value of what they're receiving. However, it was on the Senate floor where they hit us with that and they kept talking about the skin in the game. I never want to hear that phrase ever again. But I said, it's not about skin in the game, it's about a foot in the door. And you saw the demographics of the people that we serve in New Mexico. It's at risk, vulnerable populations that have faced a lot of adversity. So therefore, those are the students that are likely to not enroll in college because they think it's too expensive or they can't get to that. Um, so those were the two biggest hurdles that we had to jump through. A lot of education, a lot of outreach, a lot of banging on doors in the roundhouse that we call our capital, and really just sitting with legislators one-on-one -on -one all 
100 and some odd of them to really walk through why we need this program in their state. A really great method that I used was the degree attainment map to say, well, listen, Senator so-and-so, did you know degree attainment in your county is actually 21.5% beyond an associate degree and you're the biggest producer of oil and gas in the nation and you have 25 vacancies of engineers within this industry. And so having those one-on-one -on -one talking points were really, really necessary for us to get that bipartisan with support and getting it passed. Thank you for your question, Sarah. All right, I don't see any other questions in the gallery. Um, I will say um, I'm, I'm thoroughly impressed and I'm so grateful for the work that you've done. And um, I, in, in my research, I, would, I confirmed that education is the greatest socioeconomic mobility driver going. So um, if we're talking about making a difference and creating equity, it is one of the engines that we've got to use. And I really appreciate the work you did to make it clear that it, it needed to be made accessible to all. Thank you, Dr. Richmond. We're really excited to be a national example and we're really hoping that other states can follow suit. And we are going to be making our rounds in Washington, DC to start really advocating for this at the national level. All right, thank you so much. All right, so now I'm gonna, I'm gonna let you unspotlight. Bye-bye. Okay. All right, so here we go. Moving along in the agenda, the next thing on the agenda is officer reports. And I know that um, we've got some things. I know Rosamond had some things to report. Are you ready to give your report, Rosamond? Yes, if I can share the screen real quick. Yeah. Okay, let's see what I have here. Let me see if I can do this without messing everything up. I think you can do it. Well, well, we'll see. Cancel, let me see. Sorry about that. I don't want to keep everybody here. The last thing we need is, hold on a second. Uh, oh, let me give you my report. We have exactly $3,837.13 in the bank as of today. So that's a changing thing, and it's pretty good. Uh, we were pretty low for a while. We have now 138 members, so that's great, too. I, I think that we're doing pretty good on that also, too. Um, let me, okay, here it is. Let me go back over here. Share the screen. Is it going to let me do it? Let me see here. Here we go. Here's a screen. We usually have a budget each year, and I want you to look at the budget for this year, 2022. Some of these we've already paid out, but there's some things that we haven't paid out yet. So our budget for this year would be around $4,600, which I think is a pretty good budget because we've had, we've lost members because of, of our um, Zoom meetings and not in-person participation. We paid out 750 of this budget, and so there's another 3850, 3850 that we will need to, if you keep on this budget, that we'll need to pay out. One of the one of the things that I like to talk about quickly because I know that this has been a long meeting, and um, the things that are happening in Ukraine now, we have uh, the ability to maybe donate something to the Ukraine drive. There are a couple of things that I like to talk about first, though. Number one, um, Casa Cornelia is one of the main charitable organizations that helps at the border now. Ukraine has taken so much information, taken so much news information that we forget that there's still a crisis at the border right now. 
We also have forgotten that with the news, the Afghanistan crisis also too. So there are two things that I like to donate. This one particularly, the CAIR, is helps the Afghanistan. And they are still in peril. They still need our help. They still need settlement. Casa Cornelia is a legal form, uh, legal organization that helps at the border. But the other organization that I think that would be really nice to help out is with the Ukraine. And I've been looking and investigating a couple of organizations that help. One of them is called the UN Women, which helps women all over the country. And as I look through that, um, I think what I'd like to do is get the approval of the members of three different uh, donations. One is for Casa Cornelia for $500, the CAIR, Afghanistan, for $500, and another $500 for UN Women. Um, and I hope that I can get that approval from them. And I think that that would be show us, show us on a national level or show us at a community level that we are invested in women and helping these women in crisis. All three organizations are helping women and children in crisis. So if I could get somebody to make a motion that we can spend this money or a discussion about this, um, I would welcome that. Also a move. Second. Perfect. So maybe uh, Luana, do you wanna vote on this one for our members? Um, so which one are we voting on? Um, all, all, all three of them. So are we or do you want to do you want to take them separately? All right. So I see some hands. So it looks like we have some discussion before we actually call a vote. So I uh, go to Maria. Hi, I I really appreciate those organizations. I really do. I do want to bring to light that we don't have any, or we haven't considered maybe organizations that include trans women, especially considering the amount of bills being put forth nationally and all over just the states that are next to us, I think there should be a consideration for us to consider trans women, especially as a democratic women's club, because we're supposed to be avoiding the idea that we don't include our trans sisters. But I think all three organizations help all members of that community, no matter if they're trans, no matter what they are, they are helping women of all different ethnic, every, every, everything. So it is inclusive in that, uh, especially the young, and, and, and especially in the UN Women's, that organization helps them too, but also in Casa Cornelia. They represent everybody at the border. So it includes that also. So Rosemary, we have another um, question. We have Sarah. Um, I hi, Sa hi, Sarah. Hi, Sarah. Hi. Okay. Um, so I appreciate um, the idea that we would make donations to this type of organizations and we have uh, made some donations in the past, mostly either uh, organizations that we've donated to before or um, something that's come up uh, a little bit more impromptu, like a speaker that we have had. So I appreciate that we that we do this. Um, I would like to say that for that, particularly since this is talking about um, approving a budget that I would like to see a process for how we decide. I will absolutely be voting against and I will speak against this um, if we're going to afford and against uh, because there's no process here for anyone else to have submitted an organization. You know, I would, I'm sure that there is an organization in Texas that is particularly timely right now that we could donate to um, that would be supporting trans teens. And I can guarantee you that the three organizations that you just mentioned uh, do not fully support trans women. I, I mean, I would challenge you to present this documentation to that, but I suspect that it's not true. Um, that that isn't a, enough at the forefront of the mission of those organizations that that's going to be not just lip service, if it is even given as lip service. So, and I have donated to those organizations myself, except I've never heard of the UN Women. So uh, yes, I oppose this and I would be happy to motion that we make a plan for like a, 
to talk about a donation plan if DWC is going to be making these types of donations as opposed to political candidate donations going forward. And I'll second that. I'll, I'll so, second Jerry's motion. So would it be helpful if I made a suggestion that might make it, uh, might help us, um, one, pass the budget, and two, address the concerns that have been expressed? Um, for your consideration, what if we um, separate the two in terms of the things that we've already done um, and the things that we have to do, um, and then we... Thank you, Susan. Um, and the things that um, we want to do so that we're not, this doesn't become a long debate and people have an opportunity to give some consideration in terms of donations um, and where we donate money to. And that's absolutely true. That's why it's a proposed budget. It isn't a concrete budget, but it is a proposed budget that we look at these areas of where we can donate to. So any input into this would be extremely helpful. Uh, we need to look at all resources. Right now, there are people that are in crisis right now, uh, so uh, especially women. And so I, uh, that's why I propose this. But I think it's also valid that we have more input into how we spend our money. That would be great. And it is, again, like I said, a proposed budget. So um, let me... Let me see if I can get something about the UN. Let me see. Hold on a second. Let me see if I can share it. Okay, so um, in terms of um, a report and then action items, yeah. Um, so I think what might help. Um, this is a site for the UN women and. Um, these are helping, uh, this is the site that I looked at. Anybody that wants to look at that, they help. It, it's, it's a great organization. Uh, but uh, that was one of the things that I was looking at. I was looking to where our money would be best spent and where it would help the most. But again, like I said, uh, I would welcome some more discussion about this. Um, and our budget will, it is not large. It's right. not a big budget. Right, so we have four hands up right now. Um, Let's see who's the, um, Doug Case is up next. Or yeah. yeah, I had a question. Uh, do we have enough money in the budget to do an additional $500 to an organization that uh, services uh, trans women? Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, then maybe we can, I'll speak in favor of my motion um, and uh, would be willing, well, I guess it's already a, a, an amendment on the floor to uh, postpone it, but uh, I would suggest we go ahead and approve this and uh, do some research. I know of a couple of organizations, but I don't have them top of my head uh, that might be appropriate for an additional $500. And so I would suggest that we go ahead and approve the budget and then uh, come back uh, next month uh, with a proposal to spend an additional uh, $500 for an organization that specifically serves trans women. Right, and so next we go to Ann Cosby. Thank you, Doug. Yeah, I'd like to have a better understanding of what it is that has already been proposed, what the motions are, where we stand on that. It seems to me that it might make sense to as uh, Dr. Richmond said, to actually separate sever these motions to look at the budget or to have a dollar amount in the budget and have a committee that looks at where those monies can be donated as opposed to bringing them forward with the budget, which I don't know of any other organization that does it that way, um, especially with changing priorities. Thank you. Thank you, and um, Kenya Taylor. Hi, good evening. I was wondering, um, for clarification, what are we doing to support local candidates who we've endorsed? What it is, is um, uh, Kenya, what, what we found in the last election was this. Uh, we were given a, a, a list of candidates that we could support by the party. 
uh, this list was given to us and we abided by that list. What we found later on was that it was very difficult. For instance, I'll give you two for instance. Uh, we, we were told that we could not support um, Kate. Oh, I, uh, she was running for school board, but we could. So the, the list that was given to us from the party was incorrect. They said that we could donate to uh, Sam Hurst, Dr. Sam Hurst uh, candidacy. We could not. So it's a very tricky, very, very hard way of getting around all these rules. Every, every candidate, every district has a different rule that we have to follow. And so sometimes it's best just to give to the party and therefore they give to the candidate. Uh, it's, it's very tricky. These things have to be reported. Um, Sarah, I mean, uh, Sam Hurst, Dr. Hurst called me up and said, listen, I thought, I thought you could contribute directly to me. I just found out we cannot. We have to reverse all this. And I said, fine, let's just do it. So it was just easier if we just give to the party and let them work that, all that, that legality out and so that we're not stuck somewhere and I report something that should not be done. That's what... Um, and I always appreciate your hard work and dedication for all of our leadership. Uh, we just know that our can local candidates um, aren't always... Um, there's not equity there always, and especially our candidates out in the East. Uh, obviously, we want to represent all of our regions, but it's important for us to take care of home first. And I hope that we can support our candidates because we have some people who are running for office throughout our entire county that are out of control. And we need to make sure that 2022 is a good year not just in the general, but we need to get people through the primary. And I hope we don't have any more elections that have seven point difference, nine point difference in determining if a person gets in or not. So I just hope we could uh, really take care of home first. Thank you. Thank you, Kenya. Nadia. I actually just typed it in the chat. I put, um, I reached out when uh, the, they proposed through the Senate about purposely attacking families of trans youth because a lot of them were going to be mothers. Um, some of them are single mothers, some of them are non-binary parents. And they said that the Transgender Education Network of Texas is the statewide advocacy group. They are seeking out legal assistance for these families that have been supportive of these trans youth um, through all this in a state that is just violently against their own children. Um, outyouth.org actively serves trans youth and black trans leadership of Austin and also does mutual aid for trans adults that are houseless. So I put all that in there, something like that to me, uh, I think should be a consideration one, because it's in the United States and two, because it actively, it shows that we are considering all women, which is how the stance that we should take when we talk about trans women. Thank you, Nadia. Yvonne. Uh, <clears throat> so I guess my thoughts are that, you know, I have been a member of this club now for I think almost five years. And I don't think we, I don't see a philosophy for giving. We just kind of raise our hands and say, oh, let's give to this, oh, let's give to that. And so even when we're doing a budget, there's not priority set. It's what we've always done. And so I guess I, I kind of am feeling that maybe this is time for us to take a step up and say, you know, what, what is the philosophy of where the money goes from the Democratic Women's Club? And then focus on those as a general rule. And then we, don't, we also end up not having groups competing against each other. I, I'm concerned when we only had $3,000 in the bank of, of approving donations for 2,000 of that tonight. You know, and we have bills and other things that have to come up and we have to be ready for emergencies. So, so that's kind of where I, I, you know, where I'm at is that I think we need to stay, take a step back and, and, and look at this as an organization and be more 
definite about what we're gonna do instead of haphazard. Thank you, Yvonne. Okay, so I waited my turn because I think everybody has um, things they wanna say and I wanted to really air this out. Um, I already stated my point about, let's look at the things that we actually have to spend and then um, figure out the other stuff as the club. I did put the mission, the club mission in the chat to kind of redirect us to, to back to why we're all meeting in the first place. Um, I'm not opposed to any charitable giving. Anybody who knows me knows that not only do I give money, I give time to organizations. Um, when we talk about supporting candidates, um, there are limitations on how much money we can donate to a campaign. Um, there's always the option of donating through the party um, to a candidate, but then there are other ways that we can support candidates um, in terms of um, actions and activities that aren't donations to their campaign that we could explore in terms of um, foot leg power, get out the vote activities. Um, those are just some considerations. I really appreciate all the work that you did to put the budget together, Rosamond, but I do recall us having some discussion um, not long ago when we talked about how um, we needed to be more mindful about what our um, donation philosophy was. And I think we support all of these causes. And the question is, um, are we, what, what, is our, what is our goal and objective and what message are we trying to send? Um, so I see Sarah, Ruth, and Ilka. And then after that, I think um, we need to consider what direction we're gonna go in. Um, I'll, you know, at this point, we've got so many motions and recommendations and ideas on the floor that I'm not sure how we will close this out, but I do wanna give everybody a chance to say what they need to say. And I want us to all think about, you know, as we're making our decisions about what we're gonna do economically, um, what are our guiding principles and values a lot that go with those choices? Sarah. Um, I, I guess I had to, more of a procedural question, which you kind of answered. Um, sort of what we were doing next. And um, Doug made a point in the uh, chat that perhaps the motion on the table is my amendment, but I'm not sure where we're at with that. Um, and then my other point was, um, we should not consider ourselves to be limited um, by the difficulty of giving to local candidates. Um, difficulty is not, is not impossibility. And perhaps that just means that the way we do our treasurer needs to change, which is something we've discussed as well. Um, so thank you, Dr. Richmond or navigating. Great, thank you, Sarah. Um, Ruth Rollins. Yes, thank you. First on the difficulty of giving to candidates. What I used to do when I was president of Point Loma, we would write a check out to the county party. We would hand it to the candidate that we wanted the money to go to. And that candidate would take it to central committee part, you know, the office, and uh, they would get it credited to their candidate, to their, you know, candidacy. And that worked out pretty well. But now, you know, we're a democratic women's club. And the question is, in an election year, should we be more democratic? Or should we be continue to be more women? Because the you know, it's great to donate to all these women's organizations, but it's also an election year. And we have a lot of women that we've endorsed. And so, as I said, you need to come, we need to come up with a philosophy. If, is one more important than the other right now? I don't know. That's up to all the members. Thank you. Thank you, Ruth. I really appreciate um, your your wise remarks. Thank you. Ilka. So I know I'm not officially a member yet. I'm going to be taking care of that. But the one thing that I'm, I'm hearing, so I, I'm a problem solver, I believe that possibly inspired by you, Luana, having local music 
that we consider doing a fundraiser to raise money for the Women's Democratic Club outside with some live music. I know some local, uh, actually Candy Cane's uh, son uh, and uh, his wife have a local band. It's blues, beautiful music. Um, and we can find a location that could donate the space. Um, and it could be an outdoor event and we could do a fundraiser so we could have more money to give. The other point that I was gonna bring up because I see what Sarah's saying, we should ask Josie um, Caballero, sorry, I can't say it as well as I should, um, of National Center for Transgender Equity. We all know Josie and possibly get also Alina June who worked with CARE. So we could do an educational with some of the women that uh, you know have inspired us um, in the club, not together. So I just wanted to throw those two ideas out. And I could guarantee I can get the band to play for, and it's a local band and they're amazing. Lead singer is a woman, she's, she's powerful. Thank you, Ilka. All right, so now, um, thank you, Doug, for um, giving us some assistance in figuring out where we were. <laughs> um, so based on that, um, we have a motion to postpone consideration until there is a plan for organizational giving. So um, we've had a lot of conversation and I hope everyone has heard enough to be able to vote on that motion. Um, and with that, um, did we have a second on that as well, Doug? Oh uh, yes, Yvonne seconded it. All right, perfect. So based on that, um, all in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 I think we're gonna have to do a show of hands on this one. I'm sorry, y'all. Repeat the motion, please. Thank you. Just gonna say that. So the motion is to postpone consideration until we have come up with a plan for organizational giving. Okay. And you want us to raise our hands if we support that? Yes. All right, so we've got um, 16 um, votes in, no, oh, yeah, we're at 16. I'm looking to see if there's anybody waving their hand. Um, based on who we still have, we have 28 people, 16 out of 28 is more than 50%. I think that's enough for the motion to pass, but um, we could, oh, we're up to 17. Um, or now we're, yeah, we're at 17. So now if we, um, you Remember, know, there are guests that cannot vote in that total. I'm looking, I've been looking to see if there are guests who voted and I don't see any guests who have voted. Okay. Lu Luana, can you just be clear about the exact vote? Like, what are we exactly voting on? Separating? We're voting. So I'm going to repeat the motion for everyone who didn't hear. The motion is to postpone consideration until there is a plan for organizational giving. That motion was made and it was seconded. And we've got 17 people who have voted in favor of the motion. Okay, thank you. Dominic is 18. Okay, we're up to 18. So- um, Actually 19. 19, okay, so the motion carries. And so now, now that we've made this vote, the next step is to, you know, who, who is going to work on the um, organizational giving plan. So we can lower all our hands because now I'm going to ask for um, some volunteers to assist because it's a lot of work. And I don't think it's, I think um, Rosamond did a really great job pulling everything together and putting together a budget and her recommendations were very thoughtful and we're not opposing them. We're just trying to make sure that everything is defensible and that we've done. So if you could all lower your hands or do you need me to lower your hands? I think we re um, <coughs> right. may, I, may I ask for, for the minutes for the original motion before the one to, to postpone? Um, I believe Doug Case made the motion and who was the second? 
Yeah, but your motion supersedes that, and so okay. So do I just not put it in the minutes? Sorry, I just wanted to. Well, you, you mentioned it in the minutes, but then this, the motion is made to postpone until we have uh, a plan. Okay. Sorry. So who was the second? Just just for the minutes. Oh, for um, my for my motion, I forgot. <laughs> was was it Dave? <laughs> I think it was Dave. Dave, yeah, was, that, Dave. was that you? Dave. Okay, got it. Thank you. Yes, it was. And for the minutes, I will draw my second. Oh God. <laughs> okay. So you know you support postponing. It's okay. <laughs> all right. And so the other part of this is so first of all, do we have all right? I've still got a lot of hands up. Um, are all these hands still up because you want to um help assist Rosamond in the um the coming up with a plan for organizational giving or that's that's why I have my hand up. Thank you, Yvonne. Um Sarah, I see thumbs up, Rebecca. Are you volunteering to assist also? Okay. Um, Kenya, are you volunteering to assist? Yes, I am. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, let's see here. Ilka, we're going to get your membership worked out so that you can vote. I assume you're volunteering to assist since you were not able to vote. Um, Michelle, your hand is still up. Are you volunteering to assist? Yes, I did take it down and now I'm volunteering to assist. Okay, I just want to make sure we're clear. And then Ruth, I see your hand up. Are you volunteering to assist as well? Uh, yes, I am. Considering I was a charter member of this organization, I think I should say something. <laughs> I really appreciate your commitment. All right, so we've got um, one, two, three, four. Um, we've got four people to assist you, Rosamond. Um, let me see who they, they are. I have Michelle Krug, I have Ruth, I have Sarah Helka, and Kenya Taylor. Is that correct, everybody? Oh, and then you've got Yvonne. So wait, actually, it's more than it was more than five. It's six people. So we've got Yvonne, Kenya, Michelle, Ruth, Ilka, and Sarah. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. So what I'll do is I'll send out an email so that we can have a short meeting or to get together. Thank you, everybody. Thank and you. Thank, thank you. And thank you, Rosamond, for all the hard work you did to put all this together. And I and, and I do hope that you um, do, do know that we appreciate that. Effort. And I know that you had more in your report that you wanted to go over. And I'm sure you didn't anticipate we we're going to spend this much time on this part. No, and I'll just I just want to share one little thing and then then it's all back to you. Hold on one second. Let me share this real quick. And this is just about membership. If you have a um, any questions about your membership or you need anything, this has been my email for since 2018. Give me a call. Let me know. It's easy. Dim Club 2018 at Gmail. And that's that's all I have to share. And thank everybody. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. And then did you also want to do the report for the nominating committee? Uh, no, I think we're gonna, I thought that we had agreed to do that in April. Am I mistaken? Well, I think, I mean, I just thought we would give people an update on the status of the fact that we still have some um, seats that we're, we have. That we're trying so, to what I, so what I did for the nominating committee, I'll do it real briefly, is that I tried to email every single member asking them if they would be interested in either becoming the external vice president or the treasurer. Uh, I, I emailed over 90 members and some of them I left personal notes with them asking them. I got some response, but the response was that everybody is so busy now either on other e-boards or working for candidates or they're just too busy. So what we decided to do is postpone it until April I do have uh, Tish Leon is on the nominating committee with me. Dr. Sam Hurst has stepped down from the committee because she is going to be uh, on an e-board of another club. So we lost her. So that is uh, where it looks like now. So in April, we had decided I had made the motion that um, I would stay as treasurer and we at that for another year. Uh, we had uh, a, a few of the boards look into, and myself look into what it would cost to hire somebody to do the treasure. This is my opinion. 
I'll stay for another year. Let's save the money that we would pay a treasurer, and we could put that money back into our budget to do whatever we need to do. And that's it from the nominating committee. Oh, Sarah has her hand up. Sarah? Uh, it's from before. Okay, so I do want to clarify. I mean, basically, the, the main thing that I just want to make clear to everyone is that we do have vacancies. And so if you are interested in running for treasurer or vice president of external relations, um, that option will still be open um, when we have our meeting in April. And I, I just want you all to have that as something to consider because we would like to um, not have Rosamond doing so much um, double duty so that she can focus. And also, you know, it'll be nice to have a full board so that we can um, flesh things out in a more thoughtful way. And I see Yvonne's hand. So yeah, real, just real quickly, if we don't have members, we, we remember we passed a uh, bylaw amendment last, last month that allows the nominating committee to uh, reach out beyond our membership. And in, if there are uh, people who might be qualified and, and, and interested outside of our membership to, to run. And so I think in addition to asking if there's anybody on, in the club that would like to run, maybe also expand that ask to say, if you know somebody that maybe isn't yet a member that you think would be both a good member and uh, a possible good candidate for our board, uh, please let the nominating committee go. No. That's correct. Oh, I just wanted to say one thing. This is, I, and I forgot to mention it. My daughter graduated from the University of New Mexico with a degree in journalism. And she did that through uh, assistance, her mom and dad, <laughs> and through scholarships. So that's very proud of her. Congratulations. That's awesome. All right, so now we, oh, Ilka? Um, you know, I also was going to um, bring up when people talked about, in, you know, getting more members, um, a candidate is using a, a QR code for people to be able to donate and or become a member. Um, I'm sure we could find somebody to Q create a QR code that we can have on our phones because I meet people in public all the time and they're always like, can you look it up for me? Can you show where it is? And if we're able to get the QR code and they scan it, it's on their phone and bam, they could join the club. Um, I can send you a QR code open. Thank you. All right. Okay. Um, thank you, Rosamond, for your report. Um, Yvonne, I believe you had a report also? Well, we, I think we already discussed it, but we, we now, so officially, uh, this would be your notice, the club notice <clears throat> that we will be endorsing in the state controller's race uh, in, at our April meeting. Uh, so that'll be about, you know, we will put that in, <clears throat> in the newsletter at the beginning of the month, but in the meantime, just uh, take this as notice as we will be endorsing in that race. And then that's really all I have right now. Thank you so much. Um, Sarah, did you have anything to report? I don't have anything to report, thanks. Okay, um, Anne, did you have anything to report? Just getting up to speed. <laughs> well, I'm really glad, I'm really glad to have you join the board. Um, so yeah, um, for me, um, I don't really have anything to report either. I think that I have given you all um, plenty of um, my voice <laughs> throughout the evening. It is 8.21 p.m. And so we can go from officer reports to announcements. Are there any people who have announcements that they would like to share before we adjourn the meeting? Okay, uh, Nadia, you were the first one to get their hand up. I should play those games, right? Where they slap down on the thing. <laughs> I'm so quick. I wanted um, to tell everybody um, that my passion comes 
from the fact that I do run a nonprofit. I wanted everybody to know that uh, we create inclusive spaces specifically in marginalized communities. And I got this wonderful opportunity to go to the Youth Summit, which was put on by Aramaic Blake. It was an amazing event. It brought out so many kids. Um, we call them from south of south of 94. That's what they call us, right? We're the south of 94 people. But they had all these kids and they were so involved in understanding. And one of the biggest things that struck me was that so many of them were aware of the different states that are creating anti-trans laws. One, just for reference, Idaho um, refuses to allow any kind of transitional therapy, even mental assistance therapy in their state. And now they're pushing through a law that's going to refuse youth to leave the state so they can arrest parents who take their youth out of state in order to get these um, much, much needed things that will allow some youth to just live because they have the highest suicide rate among teenagers. Uh, Senator Scott Wiener, I'd really like if everybody could give his office a call. Uh, he proposed a bill that would make California safe haven for trans youth from Texas and Idaho and all these states. It would allow them to be able to come over here and be able to consist um, um, continue with their transition. I think this is an incredible opportunity for us to really put a lot of our backing behind it, especially as Democrats, to be able to say this is the kind of laws that we want in place. This is what we want. We want to be a sanctuary state for all these other states that are attacking. Really, when you think about it, these aren't adults. These are youth. Um, we have trans youth that come to my events, and they're as young as eight years old. So they're attacking these kids, traumatizing them by grabbing their parents in Texas and pulling them into CPS offices. So if you have an opportunity, please call uh, Senator Scott Wiener's office, tell him thank you. Uh, please pass this, call your own Senator, call your own assembly person, uh, just get them behind backing this because this is so important. Thank you. Thank you, Nadia. Um, Tish. Yeah, hi. Um, I just wanted to make a quick announcement. I belong with a, a, an organization called CARA which is the California Alliance for Retired Americans. And we're gonna be doing a forum for the sheriff race here in San Diego on April 19th. Uh, we're, gonna, we're in the process of creating the questions and the flyer. So as soon as I get that, um, I will um, uh, email it to you, Dr. Richmond, if that's okay. Absolutely. And you can pass it to the rest of the members but it will be on the 19th and we are sending out uh, invitation to all four of the candidates. So we're hoping that it will be successful. That's it, thank you. Thank you. Um, next up we have Ann Crosby. I just wanna make sure everyone was aware that the Children's Caucus is doing a special meeting this coming Saturday from nine until noon. Um, with the purpose of helping people who are running for school board, giving them uh, training specifically about um, what it takes to run and uh, what sports are available to them. So any Democrats who are interested in participating, I'm gonna put my, uh, uh, an email in the chat and anyone can uh, let me know. I will send you a link to the meeting. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michelle. Um, I, um, good evening. I wanted to let people know that the fight with Saquon is still going on. If someone could put in the chat, union busting at Saquon.org, I would appreciate it. And the ad is AT, union busting at Saquon. Dot org. Check it out. This is a fight that the workers have been trying to unite in 2019. And Saquon is doing a paper um, uh, intimidation meeting, uh, plus giving money all over the place, California Democratic Party. But it's not going to quiet us. You'd be investing in Saquon. Thank you. All right. It's in the chat, Michelle. Thank you very much. Yvonne. So I, my husband and I are hosting a meet and greet for Dave Myers, Kent Lee, Chris Ward, and Joseph Rocha. 
on Sunday, April 10th at our home. Um, I will send the flyer to Dr. Richmond and Ann and ask them to please post it in our newsletter. Uh, but any of you who are in the districts that these four candidates cover, uh, you are more than welcome to join us. Thank you, Yvonne. Um, Susan. Hi, I just want to remind everyone of the um, of the fundraiser and the meet and greet we're having this this Saturday for Dave Myers. Uh, one way that we can donate to candidates is to come to these events and um, donate to, to Dave, or at least bring friends that may not know Dave yet, and may have concerns and want to uh, want to ask questions. So. The, um, the, the John has put together a website supporting Dave Myers dot wordpress dot com, or you can email me directly, um, S B Peinado P E I N A D O at gmail dot com. And can you I will, chat? I can't put things in the chat. You, I only don't the chat, it's been open. Oh yeah, yeah, you can now. Okay, okay. So I can I can do that then. Yeah. All right. Um, SP at gmail.com. I can do the address, the time, uh, and any details that you need. It's um, this Saturday and it's uh, 11 to 1. There'll be music, um, there'll be uh, food, and I think the um, the, um, the food is from the I think United Women of East Africa. Uh, Rama's sister. So it should be um, should be a lot of fun. Thank you. Thank you. Elise. Uh, I think it was uh, someone talking about the youth summit and they said it was south of 94. And I was just uh, that summit was sponsored by BayPAC. And I'm the vice chair and I don't really know where south of 94 is. I think it was south of eight. Yeah. She was referring to the region, I believe, as opposed to the name of an organization. Yeah, but even regionally, it's generally referred to as south of the eight. Mm -hmm. okay, yeah, I just wanted to make sure. Was, of the 52. Yeah. Wanted to make sure that it was Bay Pax. OK. Duly noted. I hear it was a really good event. I'm sorry I missed it. If their family is being blown apart, they're in World War III, and we need to be sensitive to that. Um, Angela Hawkins. Oh, boy. Oh, Elise, do you want to put anything in the chat or anything for that? I did post the um, information about Barr. Oh, thank you. Uh-huh. Um, Angela Hawkins, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. I just wanted to make sure. Um... No worries. Um, I just wanted to let people know that my husband and I are uh, doing a meet and greet a fundraiser for Lori Saldana for City Council District 2 um, at our home on April 9th from 2 to 4 p.m. And I will put the information for that event in the chat. All right, thank you so much. And Sarah, I'm gonna send you the chat so that, um, cause it's a lot going in there. Um, so let's see, um, I just wanted to tell you all that um, as usual, I'm doing my random events for um, Afrofuturism this Thursday. I will be uh, moderating a panel um, that's hosted by the Schomburg, um Center. It's the Black Feminist Future Center series, Black Women Organizing for the Future. Um, it's organized, being hosted by the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture. And that's from 9 a.m. to 10.30 a.m. on Thursday. And then I will be um, a panelist um, at the seventh annual Social Justice and Education Conference at San Diego City College. Um, the theme this year is We Are Not Here to Be Bystanders. The event runs from March 23rd to 24th, and I will be doing a panel at 11.10 a.m. 
um, with um, a Johnny Brown from San Diego State and Antoinette Van Sleitman from um, City College. And I'll put the link to all of that information in the chat in case anyone wants to register because it's all virtual and you can enjoy it from your armchair. Um, Gary, I see your hand. I didn't really have an announcement. I just wanted to say, Nadia, your sister was amazing. And um, I think our governor and his team need to meet her at some point and take her best practices uh, here in California. So I'm so glad that you and Luana and whoever arranged for her to speak because it was just really inspiring. Thank you so much. I'll let her know she was super nervous. <laughs> She was amazing. And I didn't want to, I wasn't going to like out her and tell everybody that she was your little sister because I wanted her to just stand on her own because I knew she could. But of course she let the cat out of the bag herself. So that's fine. And I know you're very proud of her. Kenya, I see your hand. Yes, hi. Uh, good evening, everyone. As you know, we are in a mental health crisis throughout the nation and in California, we have opportunities for telehealth services, meaning some people are able to access mental health online without leaving their home. There's a big shortage in clinicians, therapists, uh, psychiatrists for those who are in need. And oftentimes people are having three, four month waits. If you know of anyone who's having significant mental health issues that aren't in a crisis, please ask them to call the place that they are registered with and on a waiting list each day and get on the waiting list so they could get in sooner than later because there's cancellations all the time for various reasons. But in over 20 years in the field, I'm hearing more people who are suicidal now than ever. And so we're hearing more kids. I'm seeing more children. I'm doing more safety plans weekly. And so if anybody needs any guidance or supports or resources, please let me know. But as people who are dedicated Democrats, who are very passionate, it's important for us to take care of our wellness too. And so um, please let people know that there's ways to get in the door sooner than later. Thank you. All right, thank you that for that very timely information, Kenya. Um, yeah, um, I was just reading about a, um, a vice principal or a teacher at a middle school who committed suicide on campus during the school day. And so I'm sure that um, there was a lot of fallout in terms of the impact to the children and their colleagues and everyone else. So um, let's all take care of each other and make sure that we connect people with resources because um, yeah, you just never know. I think I don't see any more hands up. I think we have had a very robust meeting. We have been on long enough to be joined by Kathy Hyatt. Kathy, it's great to see you in the space. Um, everyone, thank you for your time and attention. I hope that in the course of these this two hours, um, there was something in the meeting for you that touched you or inspired you. And I look forward to seeing you all next month. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Yes. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Have a wonderful evening. What's left of it? Oh, that was Quick. Everybody got off really fast. I guess this meeting was like extra, extra long. <laughs> You'll have to have John, John, uh, get you some. What do you call that? When you exit music, uh huh, like he does for the um, Point Loma Club. It's really fun. All right. Well, thank you all, and um, I'll see you. And of course, I'm always available if you need to reach me. And um, Kenya, thank you for volunteering to help with that work. It really means a lot. And Ilka, um, for the record, um, one of our members um, paid your membership. That's why you got changed to an M in the middle of the meeting. All right, everybody. Good night. Good night. Uh -huh. Gary and I have the same birthday. Oh, what's that? November 6th. OK. <laughs> Pretty cool. Sometimes that's election day, huh? It, that's right. Yeah. When Monica won, that was on my birthday. All right. That's a great gift. Yeah. All right. I'll see you all later.
Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye.